All right, gentlemen, I hit the record button so then I can go to my PowerPoint. Um, we all see that PowerPoint. Environmental monitoring, part A, ILM 310404CA, and I have version 22. And I thought it was kind of interesting because on environmental B, I have version 21. Um, so version 22, environmental monitoring, part A. Now this ILM, what it deals with is all about the environment and um, you know your acid rains and your uh, H2S and your sulfur dioxides and all anything that's that's um, an environmental hazard uh, that we have to analyze. And these analyzers mostly are, are set not at a plant, but they're set around the plant and some miles can be miles away from the plants. I don't know if you guys have ever done any of this stuff or gone and check analyzers that are that are environmental analyzers, but um, they're there to um, bird dog basically the plants, make sure that they're emitting what they should be emitting and how much. So that's what this ILM is all about. Go to my slideshow and from the beginning. And I take it everybody can see this. Yeah, you're good to go. Perfect, thanks. So environmental monitoring part A, and it's ILM 310404CA. Got a couple objectives here. Uh, describe the environmental monitoring and list pollutants that must be monitored or controlled. Describe environmental monitoring with regards to health and safety, and that's of course our health and safety mostly as, as instrument techs. So on, on, on page two, we have the, the start of it. So environment refers to components of the earth. So a pollutant is a substance or type of energy that has adverse effects on the environment. So anthropogenic um, uh, pollution is pollutants added to the air as a result of human activity. So human activity is whatever we do, like uh, mostly on our plants and um, basically our furnaces, our cars we drive, all that kind of stuff is, is, is anthropogenic um, pollutants. Now there are natural pollutants too. So uh, here's transportation. And it's the largest man-made source of NOx. And NOx is actually, you see it, N-O-X. It's a combination of uh, nitrous oxide and nitrous dioxide. So whenever you hear NOx, it's just car, um, it's nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen oxide. Coal refineries. We have a few of those still, and that's, that's SO2. So that's the largest man-made source of SO2. Now, each one of these um, pollutants that, that we're talking about um, in this uh, environmental ILM, we're going to be, I'm going to be showing you how we analyze this stuff um, through all the different types of analyzers. <clears throat> so natural pollutants added to the air as a result of volcanic activity. You got your forest fires, your lightning, your decomposition of land and marine life. Um, and you'd be surprised how much that actually adds to our uh, air pollution. So natural sources of nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide include volcanoes, oceans, biological de decay, and lightning strikes. And again, that's going to be on, on uh, in your ILM page three. So volca uh, volcanoes, um, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Your forest fires is carbon dioxide. Your lightning strikes are NOx. And then of course your CO2, which is your carbon cycle in the ocean and uh, the exchange of decaying matter. So estimate range between 20 million and 90 million tons per year, nitrogen oxide released from natural sources compared to around 24 million tons of human source worldwide. So <clears throat> the environment can can give us 20 million to 90 million tons per year of the nitrogen oxides, but human activity gives us 24. Now, 
where these stats came from and everything else, I have no idea, but it's, it's in the ILM. So um, it probably has changed by now, but you get the gist when we talk about this. So the, the, they won't be uh, specific. Everything that's being tested is tested in the ILMs. Whatever's in the ILMs is what we, what we can test. I mean, you can Google this stuff and find out different answers and everything, but um, Google is not on the test. What's on the test is uh, what's in the ILM. So <clears throat> industry air quality management. So the effect of industry on air quality is managed through regulation, environmental assessment, approvals, and enforcements. Now this, the, these, um, uh, this management is done by uh, um, the Canadian government and the Alberta government, and that's all what uh, part, part B is, is for, is the regulation, environment, assessment, and enforcement. So in a nutshell, <clears throat> this is what... Um, our um, 310404CB, environmental management, talks about that. So we'll be going through that next on the next ILM. So here we got source of emissions standards. We got plume dispersed modeling, um, air quality anal, uh, objectives. So we have to have your ambient air quality. Now these are where these uh, analyzers are set away from the uh, the plants and things like that. Um, that's actually to measure the ambient air and see what's in it. And then you get your your source monitoring, you get your ambient air monitoring, all your approvals by the government, and then of course environmental reporting. Um, if you guys have ever worked on these analyzers that uh, that we report to the government, it's pretty stringent and pretty strict. So pollutant accumulation, accumulation of pollutants depends on the rate of emission, how much my plant is emitting out its stack or wherever it is emitting from, uh, speed of dispersal. So uh, we're talking wind conditions here. Now, when we set up uh, uh, these ambient air monitors, analyzers, um, most of them are set up um, depending on the prevailing winds. And then of course, how nobody knows how how much wind speed we're going to have the more wind speed the further the, the dispersal of these uh, pollutants are temperature inversion so these temperature inversions can trap pollutants at ground level so in other words a temperature inversion is when the atmosphere is, is warmer than uh, the ground uh, temperature so it, it holds in all the pollutants so in this case, you can see <clears throat> this is on, on page four. You can see how we get warm air here and cooler, dense air here. Well, what happens is this any of this air is pushed down onto the ground. So you don't get that dispersal of these pollutants in here. Um, normally, this is what we get. We get the warm air on the ground and the cool air uh, above us. And then these pollutants go up and then they can they can go quite a ways, miles and miles. But when we have an inversion, they're held right close. And, and uh, then you get shows here, any of these stack emissions, it almost it stays on the ground level. So that talks about uh, um, temperature inversions. So continuous emission monitoring, CEM, you're going to see that all through the book. So this continuous emissions monitoring. Now, uh, well, these the, because these pollutants happen in, uh, 24/7, 365 days a year, we have to have a continuous monitoring. So done at the source. Concentration range from parts per billion to percent, and we do have analyzers that re measure parts per million, but um, parts per billion to percent is normally what we have. Ambient air monitoring, outside plant parameters in government specified locations. So the government will put these analyzers, um, I, again, they'll put them um, downstream of the prevailing winds mostly, but wind direction do change, so they're all over the plant, they, they circle it. Uh, it requires very sensitive analyzers, you know, greater than, greater than one part per billion. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Tim, for those yes. uh, Continuous emission monitoring standard yeah. is that uh, across uh, North America or just uh, any applies to Canada? Um, you know what? I, I'm going to just say it's just going to be Canada because I have no idea what the Americans do, but 
they would have the same thing. They, the Deb North America would have the continuing emission monitor for sure. But I, yeah, we when we deal with these uh, these um, um, analyzers and stuff, these are the Canadian rules. But I can't see any difference with Americans. I mean, fairly close to the, um, the environment and the managing the, the ambient air. <clears throat> so Alberta stack sampling, here, here we go. It's like stack, stack sampling code. So Alberta has a code for stacks that are emitting pollutants. Uh, specifies how to perform a manual stack survey on f uh, facilities that emit smaller amounts of pollutants. The CMS continuing emission monitoring system is required for facilities that emit large amounts of pollutant. So, and these are the pollutants on, on, on page seven on the left hand side. So, we, we're talking about sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, total reduced sulfur, particulate matter, and carbon dioxide. So, those are, are mostly our pollutants. There, is, there are more, uh, but like uh, example for um, ozone, uh, ozone is definitely a pollutant also, but when it's up in the air where it, where it should be, surrounding our, our, our environment, it, it prevents heat heating up of the, uh, of the earth. But there, as we know, and we've heard, or we were told, there's lots of holes in these uh, layers of oxides. ozone layer so <clears throat> if your plant has any of these pollutants may need to be monitored and controlled uh, sulfur dioxide formed when fuel containing sulfur such as coal burns uh, nitrogen oxide formed from reaction between nitrogen and oxygen when air fuel burns at high temperatures and we have analyzers for each one of these things too so and they're different analyzers and we'll be talking about them uh, carbon monoxide formed when the carbon fuels burn with restricted amounts of air. Um, we talked about sulfur formed when fuel containing sulfur such as coal burns. Uh, we're talking about particulate matter uh, formed from solid fuel combustion. And the last one, I, well, not, not the last one, but the one we'll be talking about mostly is the carbon dioxide when the carbon and fuel burns. So you can see a lot of this is when something actually burns, when we're burning this stuff. The parameter of the oxygen, uh, it's control parameter to ensure excess oxygen for combustion safety. Uh, you guys did the stoichiometry um, in third year about, the, about burning. I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, and then, of course, flow, measure to determine total volume, and temperature, measure to... Um, correct total volume to standard conditions. So basically we're just talking about what's control, what do we need to control, what do we need to analyze and how we do it. And basically, you know, on, on each one of these things that may need to be monitored, it all depends on how much we're emitting. So continuous emission monitoring code, established requirements for the installation, operation, and maintenance, and certification. And that's basically of these analyzers that we're using. Considerations, gas should be well mixed, homogeneous at the sample point to provide a representative sample. Again, this representative sample is hugely important because if we don't have a representative sample, we're not getting accurate readings. Stack mounted equipment must be easily accessible. Well, you guys know how big these stacks are. And to put up analyzers easily accessible means you got to climb up 100 feet or 200 feet on these on these stacks. But again, I guess it's easily access accessible. Methods of analyzing stack gas are in situ. In situ means right in the stack itself. I mean, your analyzers in there, um, um, your probes are in there, whatever's taken out that. Uh, taking a sample of gas is, is right in the flow stream of that stack that's in situ. And there's pictures here we'll, we'll talk about too. And then extractive, that's when something pumps it out. Or if you have a, a, a more positive pressure lower in the stack than you do at the top, then it'll just 
it'll just uh, that that differential pressure it'll push it out extract it into a uh, analyzer and then take it back into the stack so here we go here so when we look at this in situ versus extractive so this in situ analyzer here's your analyzer and there's where's where it's taken from right so it's right in the path of uh, the emissions that are going out through this stack and then of course we have this one extractive so we have a sampling system here where and you guys always remember that the sampling system is where most of the errors occur so the sampling system comes and pulls out the sample and takes it conditions it and then puts it into an analyzer whatever analyzer were whatever um, compound we're analyzing for so in situ analyzers interact with the gas directly in the stack so this is directly in the stack and this one here is extractive it extracts it through a computer calculates a mass emission rate of pollutant gases using pollutant concentration which is extractive and flow and temperature data which is in situ so in this case here this in situ portion of it gives us the flow and the temperature this here gives us concentration right so uh, the extractives is a concentration and this in situ gives us flow and temperature data uh, com combine this the uh, the percentage or the concentration and then of course this will be added to it temperature measurement and flow measurement of the actual emissions or the stack gases so we have an emission mass emission computer and it gives us mass emission rate and normally they're in tons per day stack gas opacity monitor so in this case here i've got a lamp yes is there a question Yes, Tim. For those yeah. uh, monitoring data, do those data automatically send to the environmental department, or this is sent to the government manually by each individual companies? No, these these would be sent the automatically. Well, uh, they would be they'd be basically um, data that's uh, that's obtained by the, your this, the the. Um, the plant and then sent to the, the well it could be sent to alberta government uh usually that's what it sends to the alberta government and then the Alberta government sends it to the canadian government and we'll talk we'll talk about that in in b of w which um uh where we'll be sending our information from this but yeah we as a plant you um you get, get this data record this data and then you'll send it off so the software and the equipment will be provided by the U.S. Oh, no. government. Oh no! Uh, the the uh, when you're in your plant, everything's provided by you. Uh, everybody's every every plant has to have its own analyzers, but the ambient air analyzers are government run, and they're um, they they probably contract them out, but they are all government run. This is totally different. This is within the plant. And within your plant, you're going to have to, they'll tell you what you have to monitor. Um, that's all, that'll all be set up when you have get all your approvals for your plant. Um, you'll have to have all these uh, mission standards and mission analyzers, things like that. But it, it, the standard will be set for your company and you'll have to take, you'll have to provide it and you'll have to use your own uh, analyzers. Now, there could be third party guys that come in and analyze this or take these uh, readings or, uh, I've been in a case where um, all the analyzers in the wastewater treatment plant, uh, because we, we have to analyze our, our water, our, in, our inflow, our effluent, we have to uh, monitor all of that. We would send uh, our information to the government, but there was also a third party that would come in um, and, and make sure that we are testing properly and make sure their equipment matches our equipment, things like that. So it's, it's really strict. But yeah, no, the government's not going to not going to supply these uh, monitors for you. And even even the even the third party uh, measurements and uh, when they come in, uh, the government doesn't pay for that either. That's up to the plant. Okay, thank you. Okay, stack gas opacity uh, monitor. 
we'll be talking about these uh, these uh, opacities. Um, so what happens is you get a light shining here. It shines through the entire stack, and then you have a light detector. So how much light is is transmitted? How much light is absorbed? And it's an opacity meter. And um, as I say, we will get into all of these meters uh, and analyzers in the next up until chemiluminescence. So that's what we'll be doing for the next, uh, after we do environmental, then we'll be doing actually the actual analyzers that monitor all this stuff. So percent transmittance is percent T is the amount of light that does make it across. So if I've got transmit light, transmit light, it does make it across, the rest is absorbed. So percent opacity, uh, percent zero is the amount of light that does not make it across. Um, and a lot of these uh, different chemicals and, and molecules absorb different lights. Some absorb ultraviolet, some absorb chemiluminescence, uh, which is infrared and ultraviolet. And, and we'll be, we'll be, as I say, we'll be talking about these later. So 0% equals 100% minus transmittance, percent transmittance. So three types of continuous emission monitoring. You got hot, wet sample systems. You got cool, dry sample systems. And you have a dilution probe sample system. So these would be the types of continuous monitoring on your stack. Now, we all know that sample systems cause most of our problems. And the sample system here would be, oh, I'll show you in a minute. But, so extracted samples are dirty. So when I, when I extract a, a sample from my stack gas, that stack gas could be wet and moist and dirty and all this kind of stuff, right? So we extract the sample and we start to, this is a heated filter, so we start to dry it out. And then we've got a heated transfer line that we, we send over to our, our analyzer, hot and wet analyzer. And then we get the pump and this pump takes care of the waste. And uh, remember before when I was talking about waste, um, which is a huge problem, the best thing to do is take that, is take that back, <clears throat> take that back and then in, into the stack. So that, that is the best. Instead of handling it here, you just pump it back into the stack. So um, these hot, wet sampling systems must stay above the dew point for heat. Stack gas and analyzed samples have same amount of water vapor. And again, this is part of your sample system, right? So your heated filter, your probe, your heated line that comes there, and then your pump. So cool, dry sample systems, they're the opposite of hot, wet. So what happens in this case, sample condition unit removes water vapor. So if my, if my analyzer doesn't uh, do well with water, or depending on what I'm analyzing, uh, we have to remove the water vapor. So analyzed stack sample has a higher pollutant concentration than stack sample because the water has been removed. So when I do these cool, dry sample systems, I've removed all that water. So that my, my, my sample will contain a higher percentage of that, that sample because the water's taken on. It just makes a little bit of sense. So we have to report this to the government, how that we've taken this sample out. Is, was it hot, wet, or was it cool, dry? And I'll talk about that a bit. So here we have a wet gas CO fraction. So you get CO over CO plus CO2 plus other things that are emitted. So that's my wet gas. My dry gas has CO, CO plus others. So it's going to be a higher percentage because if something's, uh, if I have more on the bottom here when I'm dividing, then it's going to be less of the CO as far as percentage. So the dry gas fraction is higher since the O2 has been removed. It just makes sense. I've removed that water from the down below, which, I, which I'm actually trying to get my fraction of the CO, carbon dioxide. But if there's water in it, my fraction is going to be smaller. This is going to be larger. So when I do either a wet gas fraction or a dry gas fraction, I have to tell the government what, not, which way I'm doing it. Reporting. So when we report page 13, 
when reporting the words wet bias or dry bias need to be included with the measurement. Dilution probe. So this here is just a, is a dilution probe. Clean air goes in here. It uses clean, dry air to draw out a diluted, uh, dilute the stack's gas. So it, it's diluted once it gets in here. It dilutes the stack gas sample also. Analyze measures three parts per million. Dilution ratio is 101. So if we look at what the stack concentration is uh, on page 13, it gives you the math to do that. So you multiply the anal analyzer reading by the dilution ratio. So I've got basically in here, I've got <clears throat> three parts per million. And I've got a dilution ratio of 101. And that's that's clean, dry air that's coming through here and diluting it. So I multiply the three parts per million times 100. So it gives me 300 parts per million. Just simple math. CMS, quality control is a daily operation check, so CMS. So you have to check these analyzers every day. They inspect for leaks and damage, adequate supply of consumables, checks to monitor zero and span drift of your analyzer, uh, periodic relative accuracy tests audits. So this is, this is where my third party comes in. So we have periodic relative accuracy test audits. So we got to make sure that our analyzers are accurate and we do that by having somebody come in and do the same test that we're doing and prove our accuracy. Periodic gas audits to determine line linearity of readings and daily system checks. <clears throat> Run cali uh, calibration gas through the probe for drift test, relative accuracy, Compares pollutant emission rates to a, a, a reference method take at the same time. So you, you get a, a reference, and I've done this lots at Suncor as far as you take a, a sample check and, and send it to the lab, and you tell them what you found, and the lab itself will do its own test. So relative accuracy. Cylinder gas audits. Uh, just to prove your gas is the same, introduce a range of gases to check linearity. Now, when, we, when we're looking at um, an analyzer output, um, they all want to be very linear. Uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're striving for anyway, whether they are or not is, is, is um, up to the analyzer, up to the, 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 um, the plant, but we're, we're trying to get it as linear as we can. So, the CEM system must be calibrated and repaired if it fails the performance criteria listed in the continuous emission monitoring system code. So this is this is our code that says, okay, you guys have um, con um, continuous emission monitoring system, and here's the code that you need to uh, ab abide by. So the code calibrates for drift. Now that's both drift. That's both zero drift. So at zero, we don't want it to be drifting. And at span, we don't want it to be drifting. So calibrates for drift, accuracy, linearity. Those are the three things that this code calibrates for. Fusion emissions, fugitive emissions. Those are emissions that are coming out from our leaks from flanges and valves and all that kind of stuff. They're the ones that escape. So fugitive emissions are uncontrolled pollutants released by leaks from pressurized equipment, such as your valves and your flanges, um, your pumps, and whatever's on, whatever is on your um, sample system. You have all these things, right? So if they're leaking, those are fugitive emissions. <clears throat> these, bypa these pollutants bypass the emission control system. So fugitive emissions, such as benzene, toluene, or cancer-causing, and other volatile organic compounds, VOCs, can have serious health effects to workers and, and communities. So if you've got a great big leaking valve or something like that, it has to be fixed. Mass spectrometry analyzers are used. Uh, in this case here, uh, we put that around our sample system. So if something is the VOCs or the benzes and toluenes are leaking, uh, the mass spectrometer will, will take uh, ambient air samples and They'll tell you if something's leaking in that area. And some of these are in shacks too. So 
Um, if you if you draw your sample out, so extractive, if it's an extractive sample, they usually go to some sort of a shelter. So your mass spec should be sitting in that shelter, making sure that there's nothing that's leaking because they could be very hazardous to, to us as, as in, instrument techs. Okay, so ambient air monitoring. Uh, now this is where the government comes in. So it look, if we look at this, we're looking at a plant here, here's a stack, and this is just an example, right? So you got plant A is here, and then plant B is here. Um, we've got these um, analyzers set up. So I've got one, two, three, four, and five analyzers set up at the time, right, around this plant. And if I look at this, my prevailing winds would be south, uh, they'd be uh, south, west or southeast sorry these are the prevailing winds because i have more more analyzers this way so it'd either be south or southeast but in this case here i've got a northwest wind it's blowing this way um it, uh, it talks about this uh the stack b here where there is no environmental monitoring at all so if, the, if it's a northwest wind all of these pollutants would be dispersed to the north or to the southwest southeast sorry and, and it wouldn't be picked up. Here, these two, three and four, these analyzer stations will be picking up most of the uh, pollutants. So it says in your ILM that you have 160 air quality monitor stations in Alberta. Um, depending on when this was written, <laughs> there's probably 100 and, there's probably 260 or now, I don't, I'm not sure. But every day, every day it changes, so uh we we were tested on the ilm so you look at this and this, what's interesting about this is that a hundred of these are operated by industry and the rest are the 60 are monitored by the government um so station monitor pollutants and wind so they they uh any of these stations wherever they're put they monitor the pollutants and they monitor the wind um if you've ever seen any, any of these these stack they're, they're even around Red Deer. There's, I think there's four or five just around Red Deer, but um, they're for the city itself. And they have a little wind monitor and wind speed, all that kind of stuff. And then they, they sample the air. So wind direction indicates location of source. Wind speed plays a role in diluting the pollutants. The faster, the, more, the higher the winds, the more they get diluted. This is a big page on 17 not much here for you guys all it is is telling you the symbols um it's telling you like the pollutant that's monitored is all these pollutants here the symbol um and then the man-made sources of what they are um a couple of these that are of interest uh we look at hydrogen sulfide and total reduced sulfur uh, h2s trs hydrocarbon processing plant pulp mills and sewage treatment facilities and you have the foul old odors. Down at the wastewater treatment plant, if you ever walk by that plant and there's foul odors, odors it's used H2S. And there's always H2S in there. Um, small amounts, mind you, but there, there is always H2S. Brown haze is from not nitrogen oxides, and that's from your transportation. Um, talk about particular matter. We haven't talked about it yet, but we're gonna talk about it in the next couple pages. So vehicle exhaust in industry emissions, you got 2.5. So your um, particular matter is 2.5 or less than 10 micrometers, uh, of, and which is called the PM10 particular matter. The 2.5, and we're going to talk about this in the next slide anyway, so I won't, I won't go into it right now. Next one is uh, total suspended particulates. particulates. So your vehicle exhaust, industry emissions, and it's less than 100 micrometers or microns. And then volatile organic compounds, um, vehicle exhaust, refineries, petrochemical plants, and you get the benzene and toluenes. Air monitoring. Okay, this in this case here, um, these, these are the, the um, analyzers that we're going to be using. And these, these analyzers, chemiluminescence, infrared, fluorescence, ultraviolet, flame ionization, all of these we're going to be talking about. 
and how these these uh, flame ionization are that's mostly the detectors themselves. So these are the methods. So chemiluminescence gives us uh, NOx, the NO1, NO2, which is equal to NOx. A combination of nitrous oxide and nitrous dioxide gives us NOx, NOx. Your infrared uh, analyzers, they give you carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Fluorescence gives you SO2, sulfur dioxide, H2S, and total reduced sulfur. This is a huge slide because if you if you look at this slide here, um, each one of these analyzers, uh, you're going to have to know what they actually uh, monitor or what, what what they can detect. So if I've got CO, CO2, I'd use infrared, ammonia and NOx, I'd use luminescence, fluorescence for SO2. So this kind of slide just sort of put this in your brain because you'll be asked questions um, on what analyzers do what, what, what do they analyze for? So chemiluminescence, the analyzer type and description, chemical reacts between NO and ozone emits the light. Uh, some gases absorb IR, so some gases absorb infrared, the amount of absorbed proportional to the gas concentration, uh, fluorescence, uh, sulfur dioxide emits visible light when it's exposed to ultraviolet light, the intensity of the visible light emission is proportional to the concentration of sulfur dioxide. Some of the uh, some gases absorb ultraviolet light, the amount of absorbed proportional to the gas concentration. And of course, flame ionization, FID uses gas chromatograph or chromatography, hydrocarbons burning in hydro hydrogen flame, conduct electrical current proportional to the concentrations of hydrogen carbide. I would take this whole thing out here and I would I would make myself very familiar with all of these things because these are the analyzers we talk about and this is what they do. So that's that's on page 18. Catalytic converters convert sample to the type of gas needed um, for response by the analyzer. Um, so when you have a chemiluminescence analyzer, I need a, an NO catalytic converter. So I get NH3, I get NO2, comes into this catalytic converter, and then I get NO coming out to the chemiluminescent analyzer. <clears throat> when I look at B, H2S or TRS, so H2S, a TRS catalytic converter, it moves it um, to the fluorescent analyzer. So these converters are needed so that these analyzers can actually pick up how much SO2 we have. So total reduced sulfides, sulfur dioxide, and H2S. All hybrid carbons, uh, we've got a catalytic converter there, uh, flame ionizing analyzer, and this picks up some of them, all, all the hydrocarbons go in here, some bypass it and go on to the flame ionization analyzer. So again, it's just showing you how we need catalytic converters to convert some, some of our uh, molecules so that the analyzer can read it. Sample shelter. Of course, we talked about these, uh, these sample manifolds it's taking these manifolds off and going to different analyzers, right? So the, uh, this one will go to SO2, this one will be taken down, uh, H2S, CO, and then this is calibration gas that will calibrate each one of these, uh, that will go through here and will calibrate each one of these. But this is the shack itself. And then, of course, this is the ambient air. Uh, so you get a moisture trap, fan, kind of stuff like that. So sampling manifold must not react with the sam air samples. We have to use glass or for H2S, SO2. Sam cal sample calibrations and check gases must be prepared as needed. So that's our, that's going to be, when they say prepared as needed, that's, that's going to be up to our sampling system. Particulate matter. So measure the mass of part particulates per volume of air for three size ranges. So less than 10 micrometers or microns, total suspension is TSP. 
T, uh, we got uh, lesson 10. So we call that particulate matter 10. So if I've got less than 10 uh, micrometers, we've got, it can be an inhaled into the nose and throat. And then the third one is, is less than 2.5. So PM of 2.5 and that um, 2.5 micrometers, it can enter the lungs. So all of these are particulate matter so I, I put this I put this on here. So you got a human hair of 50 to 70 microns in diameter. So you've got PM 2.5 uh, combustion particles, organic compounds, etc. It's less than 2.5 microns in diameter. And this PM 10 dust, pollen, mold, etc. It is less than 10 microns. So. It's just showing you the human hair, and this is grains of sand. It's just giving you some sort of reference to how small these particles are. Laboratory sampling, polycyclic aromatic carbons, PASs, formed during incomplete combustion of organic substances, fuel, wood, garbage, etc. You get samples taken for total suspended particulate filter. Volatile organic compounds, you'll hear this, VOCs, organic compounds that create vapors, solvents and gasolines are examples of it. Benzene and toluene are, are very harmful to us, the VOCs. So leaks and spills, as well as sources that create vapor causes toxic release. So we don't, all that stuff that we just talked about is mostly in, in your ambient air, but we do touch on water quality management too, but not a whole bunch, but we do touch on a little bit. So Alberta water sources, you have surface water, which is rivers, lakes, wetlands. They must be treated for human consumption. So <clears throat> um, we get all our water from, um, well, you know, in Red Deer anyway, in most cities, um, we don't drill wells, we just take it from the water. And all that water that we take it from their streams and rivers, has to be treated for consumption. So groundwater, accessible by wells. Um, and then human contamination would be, uh, be from the following. End of pipe, which is discharge of treatment plant or treated water from your plant. If you have cooling water towers and stuff like that, um, most of the times uh, you analyze that water and then you can pump it right back into the river. Um, so that's point source, end of pipe, they call it. And non-point source, that's all your agricultural runoff and your storm drains, whatever's collecting um, uh, the, the water. So point source is just the end of the pipe. So that's just strictly a, a discharge from your plant. And then non-point source are coming from your farmer's fields, coming from your storm drains and cities and stuff like that. Um, when we look at this measure, measurement category, um, measure the uh, physical characteristics, you measure the chemical characteristics, and you measure the biological characteristics. And then we talk about that. We talk about temperature, color, turbidity, conductivity, uh, these things in third year. Um, then dissolved oxygen, pH, minerals and chemical pollutants. And then of course the biological is, is, is bacteria, parasites, plant of plant and animals. So that's what we're, that's what we're monitoring. Now when we talk about the oxygen levels, um, here we've got an end of the pipe. It's just pushing out into a river. Um, it talks about, it talks about oxygen content and for healthy fish or for fish to be healthy, you need at least nine milligrams of oxygen per liter. <clears throat> nine milligrams a liter of oxygen. And if it's less than that too, it will kill whatever's in there as far as fish. Again, we don't talk a lot about this. This is about the only slide we talk about the water. Uh, we do talk a little bit about water, but not like we do for uh, stack emissions and stuff like that. So. We mostly are talking about ambient air uh, in these ILMs. Water, water quality, we'll talk a little bit 
uh, about um, the pollutants in water, but we don't go really deep into it. Okay, learning objective two, page 24. Describe environmental monitoring in regards to health and safety. So a government and industry programs protect the public and employees from environmental risks. Um, monitored categories, we're looking at air quality, we do acid rain, we do climate change, ozone layer thinning, water quality. So these are the main ones on oh, occupational health and safety. So these are the main ones that we're, we'll be monitoring. So of course in here, air pollutant can affect your heart and lungs depending on the con concentration and length of exposure. I mean, even if there's forest fires, uh, the radio tells you, yeah, stay inside if you can or whatever, right? So these are the things we're talking about. Smog is a brown haze of pollutants trapped by a temperature inversion. So if my, <clears throat> my atmosphere is warmer than my ground level air, it's an inversion and it keeps all that pollutants on, on the ground level. Um, this is page 24. And it's talking about vehicles and, and uh, VOCs and NOx here. Um, and then also we'll talk about smog equals ozone and particulate matter. So that's what our smog is. <coughs> ozone on the ground level is, is, um, is a pollutant. Ozone in the atmosphere is not. And Alberta air quality information from public, uh, for the public is measured in air quality health index. So AQHI. H -A -Q -I, A A Q H I is calculated based on the data from the following measurements. And this is uh, uh, ground level ozone, uh, particulate matter, nitrogen dioxides. And this is what they're saying. Uh, this is parts per million. So one to three is a low risk, four to six is moderate, uh, seven to 10 is high and 10 plus is very high. So this is just, uh, Alberta Provincial Regulation Air Quality Health Index, and this is what they go on. So when they tell you that, uh, you know, in, in your uh, weather channels and stuff like that, they talk about ozone and they talk about things like that. Acid rain, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides react with water to produce sulfuric acid and nitric acid. So there's my acid rains. So we're looking at SO2 and NOx for acid rains. So uh, the, you know, the NOx, which is nitrous oxide and nitrous dioxide, and the SO2, sulfur dioxide, coming from stacks and plants and all that kind of stuff, it goes up in the air and then it rains down, right? Because it, it it's, it's, uh, reacts with water. <clears throat> so HNO3 and H2, H2SO4 are, are acid rains. Climate change, this is where I was talking to you about the ozone layer. There's the atmosphere, and this is the ozone layer here. Occurs when long-term weather patterns alter. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane gas all absorb infrared, which causes them to heat up. If they heat up, and if there's lots of that in the atmosphere, the world will heat up. The ozone uh, layer thinning. Ozone um, layer acts as a shield of ultraviolet light from the sun. If I have, we have holes in the ozone layer, and this ozone layer here is very important to us, but if there's ozone down in here, it's a pollutant. Chlorofluorocarbons, uh, CFC, use refrigerants, aerosol sprays, and solvents contain chlorine and fluorine that react with the ozone. The big one used to be Freon, and we don't use Freon. That used to be our refrigerant for our, uh, our fridges and freezers and stuff like that. We don't use Freon anymore. Water quality, again, portable water is for drinking, cleaning, bathing, and other activities where water is consumed by humans. So it all has to be treated. So the situation here is here's your sewage plant. Here's your water treatment plant. The sewage plant is always downstream. However, um, I, worked at this, I worked at the sewage treatment plant in Red Deer for three years, and we were, we were given awards. The water that we were, our, which is called effluent, coming out 
was cleaner than the water that was that was going by. Um, simply because the, there's so much uh, so much pollute, pollution in these in these water. When we treat it, uh, in the sewage treatment plant comes from the houses for sewage. We treat this all, and that effluent or the water that we pump back in the river is cleaner than the water that's going by the plant. It's just kind of interesting. Drinking water must be treated before use, and effluent must be treated before returning it. So they take it up through the, the water treatment plant. They they uh, deliver it to the all the houses. All the houses have sewage and water and drain back into the sewage treatment plant, and it's it's pumped back into the main watershed, the same watershed. So continuous emission monitoring and ambient air monitoring are both used in Alberta track the pollutants in the environment. For health and safety, it's important to monitor the following categories, air quality, acid rain, climate change, ozone thinning, uh, water safety, and occupational health and safety. And that's it for this one. So we don't talk a lot about analyzers here. It shows you some of the analyzers that we need to use. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about uh, in the later, like the chemiluminescence and spectroscopic analyzers and UV analyzers and infrared analyzers. Um, that one page is, is huge for you to understand so that you know what we're measuring and what we're actually analyzing for. Okay, I'm going to stop this sharing and turn off the recording.